But our first panel this morning is Adapt or Die, News Media, New Media, Trans Media. And I'm going to invite Paul Brislin to come and moderate that panel and introduce us to the amazing people who will be speaking to us this morning and being in conversation with us. Paul is ex-CEO of Two Ants, the New Zealand Telecommunications Users Association, and um, something of a media darling. I'm really excited. This is what That's I love so about... Delightful. I know, it's gorgeous. You are, he's delightful. This is what I love about NetHui is that so many people that you know online, you finally get to meet in person, and Paul is one of those people, and I'm thrilled to meet him this morning, So and so should you be. So give him a massive round of applause, Paul Brislin. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Are you all good? You're all caffeinated? That's very good to hear. And a big shout out to Kelly, because I used to be a subtitler as well. That's where I got my start in uh, journalism, was typing uh, episodes of One News and making sure that the captions made some kind of sense with the uh, pictures that were being shown on screen. I'll invite the panellists up. If you come on up, and I'll introduce you while you're coming up. We have couches here and microphones, so uh, bring your notes. I found it's quite hard to jump up on the front of the stage because it's quite steep. It's deceptive. Come on up the sides and grab a seat and we will uh, kick off. Disruptive change is what we're talking about. Oh look, he's youthful. Youthful and vigorous. Disruptive change, uh, the impact on news, media. Uh, I've got written down here creatures, but I'm sure that actually should be creatives. So um, I apologise for any creatures if you're not being disrupted. It's, it's a passion of mine. It really is quite important that we fully uh, come to grips with uh, just what a change is taking place in our media landscape. Uh, as a former newsprint journalist, um, I've seen the changes in the newsroom, uh, massive sweeping changes that um, require a glass of wine to discuss in full detail. But um, it's, it's not just the newsrooms, of course. Uh, and last night, I spent most of the evening preparing my notes for this by arguing vigorously with uh, Paula Browning and uh, Dan Slevin online. Uh, and are you here, Paula? You are? There we are. Uh, Paul is here, uh, Dan's in Wellington, he wanted to come up and argue some more but I wouldn't let him which is probably just as well. Trish Hepworth as well, um, uh, we had quite a good discussion about the impact of all of this on copyright and what it means for producers of content and that's where the panel's going to take us today hopefully. So I'll introduce them one by one, the, the, uh, the model today is they'll talk for three to five minutes each. If you've got questions, hold on to them, save them for the end. Uh, we will um, have plenty of time at the end for questions for everyone, but we'll, we'll go through all the panellists and what they've got to say first of all, and then we will um, uh, cut to the questions at the end. I'm no fan of questions that start with, I'd like to make a statement. <laughs> so if we can minimise that, I'd be happy. Also, the, uh, uh, my, part, my question comes in three parts and has an appendix, if we can reduce those as well, because there are rather a lot of you. <laughs> and somebody's put up with that already. So I will call first of all on, who was up first? Megan. Megan. Hello, Megan. Megan is from Radio New Zealand, uh, and in her introduction uh, to us all on the list, Megan said that she is the cardigan-wearing public broadcasting advocate. No cardigan today. So uh, she will talk a little bit about how the internet has changed, what she does as a journalist, um, the, uh, the impact it's had on Radio New Zealand, and Megan has a new job. Megan is now the community engagement editor for Radio New Zealand, which is a massive job, and so I'd like you all to welcome Megan to the panel. Um, so yeah, so I've been at Radio New Zealand for 10 years, 10 years in one week actually, um, and when I first started at Radio New Zealand we had a website that was one page, uh, it had our frequencies on it, I think it had a picture of a bird, um, it had probably our fax number, um, in fact it probably still has our fax number, let's be honest, um, and it, there, was nothing, there was nothing on there basically, and um, it's hilarious to look back at it now and see how much has changed in 10 years. We've just hired or advertised for seven new jobs uh, in our digital team, uh, which is still pretty small, but growing very rapidly. And Radio New Zealand is in the process of doing exactly the title of this uh, topic, which is Adapt or Die, um, because uh, we've been in a bit of a holding pattern for the last five or 10 years, um, and 
we are great at radio, we are very, very good at radio, um, and we haven't been doing the internet very well, and that's not a thing we can carry on doing anymore. So, yeah, my new job as community engagement editor is going to be um, finding out what we should be doing on the internet and trying to encourage people to do it. Um, I'm reading my notes off my iPhone, um, I tweeted this morning that I was going to do this. None of these things existed when I became a journalist. We had to look people's numbers up in the phone book. Um, and actually, I, when I, my first or second year, everything except iNews, which is the... No, actually, iNews went down as well. We had nothing to write the news with. So we had uh, our, this program with which we uh, write the news and the program with which we edit and play audio on the radio and our internet went down all at once for about 12 hours. Um, so if you happen to be listening to Checkpoint that afternoon, everything was live, and we were handwriting stories on a piece of paper um, and handing them to the editor who was editing with them, them with a red pen and then handing them to the newsreader. Um, if that happened now, I can't even imagine what would happen. Occasionally, CoStar, which is the audio editing one, goes down and you, you, know, you hear more live interviews than you normally would, but I can't imagine what would happen now if that happened. If we couldn't do the internet, if we didn't have the internet, we couldn't do our jobs. I've looked at, I don't know, I don't think we even have phone books in the building. Um, and I worked at Radio New Zealand International, which is our Pacific broadcaster, uh, and I've, in the last few years, travelled around the Pacific and been to places where you can't get 3G uh, for most of the day. And being in Kiribati and having a, basically an hour window at the end of the day to uh, file my stories and catch up on what had happened on Twitter that day and realising that actually I didn't have time to be angry about that thing that that person said because I only had an hour on the internet and I needed to tell my mum I was okay. Um, it's completely changed how we do our jobs, and it's made it better, it's made it heaps easier. I don't have to, uh, you know, research is much, much easier than it used to be, but it's also harder. Um, we sacrifice a lot for the speed of getting stuff out on the internet. We sacrifice a lot, we sacrifice sometimes accuracy, we sacrifice context a lot of the time. But it's also fundamentally changing what our job as a journalist is. So if there's um, a weather incident like there is today on the East Coast, 15 people with smartphones are there much, much quicker than we can get there if we don't have a reporter on the ground. And especially for radio journalists, we're so used to the immediacy and the speed with which we can do stuff on radio being the important thing about how we do our jobs. We don't have that anymore. So we're still trying to figure out uh, what it is that our jobs entail now um, and, who, and who we are as journalists. Um, the other thing is we're very used to being the gatekeepers of information. Um, and we're not anymore. Most people on the internet know more than we do about what's going on. Don't know that people would be happy with me saying that, but anyway. Um, yeah, people on the internet know more than we do about what's going on, and we're listening to them, and I think we probably need to get a bit better at listening to people about what they want to hear, what they want us to do. That's it. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Megan. That's your cue. You can all clap. There we are. You're quite right about the speed of things. Uh, I was looking at, um, there was a plane crash in San Francisco a few years ago. Uh, the first tweet was, as the plane was crashing, oh my god, I'm watching a plane crash. Uh, the first request for an interview came 47 seconds later. So people were tweeting as they were disembarking from the plane. This is not recommended. You want to get off the plane and then tweet. They were way in the queue. They were all very man mild-mannered. So the, the, the pace has changed quite dramatically. And, uh, and I think that's, um, uh, that's fantastic. You know, as a news gatherer, as a news observer, there's nothing like it. That's why Twitter is the news feed of the future, I think. So I'd like to call on Alex. I'll just adjust the technology. Alex is head of department for the Department of Screen and Performing Arts at Unitech. Alex is a documentary maker and I hope has quite a different take on uh, the nature of disruption. Alex Lee. Uh, kia ora, everyone. Um, you're quite right, I am a filmmaker. I consider myself a creative entrepreneur, and I think that part of the job of being a creative entrepreneur is to see where trends and directions are going. So one of the jobs that I do as well is that I run the documentary New Zealand organization together with a colleague of mine, the executive director, Dan Shannon, and we look at the ways and means in which documentary is being developed. Um, as a filmmaker, we, we do need to adapt because traditional film is changing. 
Um, years ago, we would be content in seeing our film either play on TV or, or in the cinema. But as you know, um, cinema box offices are changing because a lot of people are preferring to uh, build communities and find their own uh, media through using uh, their devices. Um, if, if you look at the way television has grown, especially in the area of documentary where there's no public broadcasting, that people are searching through the internet for ways and means in which they can actually uh, find content. Um, the, the whole entire media industry, the whole entire film industry is, uh, what I say, going through a democratic revolution where storytelling is now in being engaged at not just the filmmaker's point of view, but also within the audiences. So the communities themselves are starting to build their own stories. So a filmmaker can't actually go these days to a commissioner or a funder and say, I've got a great idea for a film. They need to think about how they build a community. Communities. And the internet's a very important part of this because for us to be able to build a community, we need to think about the types of audiences that we have. There are two, I see two types of audiences, people that are preferring just to skim across the surface of a story and those that want to do a deep dive. And for the best part of the uh, area of documentary and people who are really interested in social change, and I, I hope that there's a growing number of us, that we're wanting to deep dive. We're wanting not just to go to a film to say, uh, oh, okay, that's a great story. And when the film finishes, there's no conversation. The conversation needs to continue on because in the whole, whole area of storytelling, we always believe that stories need to be shared. So in the old ways in which we would have storytelling, we would sit before a campfire or maybe at a dinner table and maybe uh, grandma or granddad or uncle or auntie would tell us a story. And through that, we would listen and then we would go on and we would disseminate that to someone else. And when we think about the internet, the internet has got to provide the same kind of basis for us to be able to disseminate so that people that are listening to uh, or watching films are able to converse, they're able to then uh, create a conversation with other people within the community and not just themselves, so that the story has a chance of growing. Because when you go from um, watching, you need to go from watching to become uh, someone who's actively participating. Because if I ask each one of you, I mean, what sort of uh, audiences are you? I don't think any of you would want to be an audience that just sits and... Uh, absorbs and that's it. I think that you want to participate in the story because when we listen to a story, when we watch a story, we are physical participants. We're not people that are just sitting there and just, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, just subconsciously absorbing the story. We're consciously actually asking questions of the storyteller as to where the story is telling. So I think that's where the um, excitement of uh, the, uh, I suppose, the disruption that there is uh, that's presenting to storytellers. But it's a challenge because as a storyteller, most storytellers only know how to tell a story. They don't actually know much in the area of technology. And I think that one of the big adaptations that we need to have is to learn to collaborate, to be able to work more closely with technologists. So one of the things that the New Zealand Film Commission has asked us to do as, um, in the Documentary New Zealand Trust is to develop digital storytelling and collaboration. So we're coming up with a strategy. And one of the things that we'll be doing um, as of, um, well, we've started, is called Story... You're being too eat. I'm being too eat. You are, you are. That's the wrap-up. Okay, yeah. and the wrap up is that the uh, Story Age is a uh, initiative where we're trying to bring the technologists and creatives together to do a whole series of hacks so we can create new prototypes of storytelling. And that's something that you know, will be available to all of you if you're interested in the area to join us uh, in developing new forms of storytelling. Wonderful. Thank you, Alex. Carrie is next, Carrie Stoddard-Smith. Carrie is, if she's not trawling Twitter, she's probably talking nonsense to her cats. Aren't we all? <laughs> she has a Master's of Law, specialising in international law and politics, uh, and would describe her politics as kaupapa Māori. Uh, Carrie, welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, is this on? That's you. Uh, morena. Uh, ko te uh, ko Nati Totahi Rawako Nati Rehi Nga Hapu, Ko Tari Nga Temarai, uh, Ko Kari Tako Ingoa, uh, Norada Tinako Te Tinako Te Tinako Te Katoa. 
Um, for Māori, te mihi is an integral part of any hui. Um, it tells you part of my story, um, where I come from, how my tūpuna arrived here, uh, from the peoples I descend and my connection to my maunga and awa. Um, carrying on from Alex, I actually want to talk about uh, Māori oral traditions, which are steeped in narratives and storytelling, and how blogging and social media have provided new spaces for Māori voices. Um, Alex has talked about, well in his little bio he sent, about audiences being curators of content. And in Te Ao Māori, um, we've always kind of been curators of content. We have motia tia, our traditional songs. We have whai kōrero, our formal speeches. We have our karakia and our whakatauki, so our prayers and our proverbs. Um, and so I wanted to talk about the eruption of Māori voices, voices online and in formal broadcasting. Uh, we, which has been huge. We've got Māori television being the closest we have to a public broadcasting uh, broadcaster in Aotearoa, um, and that's hugely significant and something that Māori should be proud of. Um, and the talent pool in the media industry of Māori is hugely inspiring. And um, we also have in the Ngāti blogosphere, we have some of the sharpest Māori minds. We've got Marama Davidson and Leonie Pihama. You know, these are mana wahine. Uh, we've got Morgan Godfrey and Joshua Hitchcock. You know, these are rangatahi who are putting out um, hugely um, intelligent Māori stories from a Māori perspective. Um, we've got digital media platforms like Tangata Whenua and Itangata where we are sharing news and views from Māori voices. And these writers aren't even necessarily journalists. The art for them is in knowing and understanding our kaupapa and our tikanga. Um, we've actually even got digital publishers like Kiwa Digital who have their own patented technology um, for telling our stories and making, making them multilingual so they're not only available in uh, English and te reo Māori, they're also available in many other languages too. Um, so I think it's fantastic that our voices aren't only heard now through the moderation of mainstream media, and I'm not talking about mainstream in a pejorative, I just mean in a general mainstream way, um, where in the past our stories were actually told for us from a perspective that wasn't actually our own. Um, in saying that, I still think we experience disproportionately more negative stories um, in the mo in media um, over our innovation and successes. Um, I hear more about uh, Māori committing violent crimes or divisions in Māoridom or Māori wanting things for free. But I don't hear about Māori businesses, um, award-winning businesses. I don't hear about uh, kura kaupapa that experience high rates of achievement compared to their mainstream counterparts. And I don't hear about um, internationally acclaimed research carried out by Māori academics or about our Māori people who sit in United Nations forums for Indigenous peoples. Um, however, the digital environment does enable Māori to share our perspectives and our stories to wider networks, so we're able to put our own positive stories out there um, to share with the rest of the world. And many Māori have actually adapted to this space to share um, those perspectives and reach international audiences. Um, and I think this is going to go some way to overcoming some of those barriers that we've had in the past to being heard and actually to tackling some of those gross assumptions and stereotyping about our people as well. Um, for me, social media and blogging um, has, has and actually can facilitate the process of whakawhanaungatanga, which is the sharing of stories and getting to know each other, building a rapport and trust online. Um, it can also do the complete opposite. Um, so while we'll never eradicate violence, uh, sorry, ignorance, um, we can, I guess, uh, improve the accuracy of our story's survival of language. Um, so I just want to say ka whawhai tonu mātu aki aki aki. Thank you, Kerry. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Walid al Sakaf is next speaker. Uh, Walid is from Yemen. He's a software developer, an internet rights advocate, and a postdoc researcher at the Stockholm University with a passion for promoting a strong and open internet. Walid designed, I'll just tell you a little bit about his background. Walid designed the YemenTimes.com as the first news website uh, in Yemen. In 2007, he launched the YemenPortal.net as the first news aggregator and search engine of its kind in the Arab world. Uh, when the website was blocked by the Yemeni government in 2008 before being an open platform that allowed dissent to be heard, he developed al a website censorship mapping circumvention solution, because as we know, there's no way around uh, this kind of thing. Treat it as damage and route around is what I'm trying to say. I'll stop talking. Let's hear from Walid. Thank you very much. Um, 
Uh, first of all, uh, to save me the two-week humiliation, I've set up my own timer. <laughs> you never know. I Such didn't come all the way to, <laughs> to have a bird mock me. Uh, <laughs> anyway. So uh, the bottom line is that I come here as the board member of the Internet Society, and, and many of you have seen the inter-community event, which I applaud, actually. It's the first ever global event where everyone around the world was able to participate potentially through a hub. So it d does really indicate what the Internet has brought us. It brought us unity. It brought us ab ability, uh, the ability to communicate with anyone, anytime around the world. The only big issue here is that we don't, we should never, as journalists, as I'm also, my background is also a journalist, see this as a threat. Uh, the internet should be an empowering tool. And oftentimes people say, you know, the internet has brought us illegal um, criminal activity, it, it has brought us hackers, spammers. But the problem is not the internet per se, it's the people behind the internet. So let us not see the internet as, as a threat in its own, but it is a reflection of what we do as human beings. And oftentimes at Stockholm University, when I uh, talk with my students about how is it that the many people are seeing the internet as a threat, I keep telling them, you know, the internet has one fundamental characteristic, which is, which is the ability to be anonymous. And obviously, if you are anonymous and you wear a mask, and you've seen so many Hollywood movies, when criminals come about a bandits attack a bank, what do they wear? A mask. So it's not the mask's fault. It's the person behind the mask that's making this. And also, uh, on the other hand also, it's important to understand that you as a, as a user of the internet, whether a journalist, a regular user, have the responsibility of understanding the risks you are putting yourself into. The fundamental shift that's going on in the new media sphere, I'd say, is the end of, or of what we used to call the gatekeeper. As media organizations usually had the editors, they stood there making sure that everything is on track as what they were supposed to have. And also the media has uh, its line uh, that's been drawn before, no one would deviate from it. But when you remove the intermediary link, that gatekeeper, then this ability to control content disappears. And everyone would have the same powers, so more or less. And that would lead us to one fundamental shift or understanding, which is that everyone is now responsible for their own action. It's not possible to impose the same, uh, let's say, on the whole institution what a person does or doesn't, because eventually every person is responsible for what they do. So what is going on right now is uh, the need to, uh, uh, to understand the ramifications. And while the Internet Society as a body uh, ensures that the Internet is accessible to everyone, it's uh, open and it's uh, stable and secure, the fundamental uh, say responsibility lies on the media institutions themselves. And, and that's where I'd like to bring in the issue of capacity building or the issue of uh, creativity and innovation. As human beings, we have evolved, and I like the word adapt. It reflects the evolution of how we think. I mean, we 40,000 years ago in the ice age, we were able to survive the harshest conditions on the planet. And it's because the way of thinking has uh, changed. And if newspapers do not take an approach of understanding, there needs to be a more than simply post, uh, posting or copying a, a tweet or a blog post, they will actually suffer from the same consequences. And that would lead to um, demise in the market. And let me remind you today that uh, the 60 up to 60 percent of what it goes social on social media is fake, and this may come as bad news. And if you are a journalist trying to think, consider it as a tapping, let's say getting a hint or a tip, then you better uh, you know <laughs> reconsider. And there is the tweet: <laughs> technology doesn't work, as they say. But I ha I, I do have one more minute. You go. <laughs> Give it the bird. Yes. And you took my minute, by the way, when you introduced me. <laughs> so, I mean, the bottom line is that uh, we all need to understand that's the human element, the human risk, uh, the human factor that's involved. And if you put the fake news and you copy it, then you get the end result of it. And so, internet is there for us all. We need to keep it open. We need to keep it uh, secure. But we also need to revise what we do in our daily lives. Thank you.
Thanks, Wally. Tim Watkin is our last speaker. Tim has been a journalist for a quarter century. He started out in newspapers and magazines and in 2006 won the Wolfston Scholarship as New Zealand's best print journalist uh, for his time as deputy editor at The Listener. Uh, he moved into TV, was the founding producer at uh, TVNZ's Q&A, and then onto TV3 to create The Vote, uh, and then most recently to become the executive producer of The Nation. Uh, he also uh, has a little blog on the side just to fill in his spare time. Ladies and gentlemen, Tim Watkin. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Tenakoto. And um, yeah, I... I I guess I'm here, I'm the corporate shrill, the, uh, the mainstream hack on this panel, so um, I expect the questions will go that way. Um, and look, I agree that, that uh, technology by itself is, not, is neither bad or good, you can't put that onto a, a technology. Um, and yes, of course we have to adapt or die, and in fact, just about, and every newsroom really in New Zealand now is operating a, a digital first strategy, uh, and so the adaptation is, is well underway. But I guess I, just for fun, if nothing else, I want to play devil's advocate a little bit today um, and talk about some pretty serious buts that uh, respond to everything else that's been said today because there are some pretty serious buts that journalism is facing. Um, there is no, obviously we all know this, there is no bust and, and, and um, sustainable uh, profit model around where... Uh, uh, media organisations um, of the scale and, and professionalism of the past couple of generations um, can, make, can continue online. Uh, if I knew the answer to that, I'd be sunning myself in Los Gatos, not sitting here on a freezing Auckland morning. It's hard and no one's figured that out yet. So let me just, what I thought I was, I'd paint a picture and I'll break it down into three parts very briefly. The first part, I guess, of journalism is gathering. Uh, the internet has done, has been an immense uh, benefit to that. Um, we get stuff quicker. As Paul said, the, the access to people observing things and in the field is so much quicker. Um, our fact-checking is much easier. We have access to data um, so much quicker and easily uh, than we used to. I am old enough to remember um, going down into the dungeon at the New Zealand Herald for the clippings files um, and pulling out the old manila folder full of, uh, of old stories. I remember starting the, the Aotearoa Student Press Association when I was at universities where we could, my God, share news from campus to campus by faxing each other their story, our stories and <laughs> time for deadline. So things have changed um, dramatically now. We can now do stories as the nation did a few weeks ago, which um, alleging that Cameron Slater broke the law because we have a data trail of phone records to be able to back that up. So there is a whole new um, uh, ability to do new to do news, um, which is which is better. There is the delivery of news. Um, I guess that's probably slightly more mixed. We do have the speed that everyone has spoken about today. We do have the democratisation. Uh, of that, more people, more places, more platforms. Um, but here is one of the, the buts. Um, that speed comes with a, lo a, a loss of quality. Um, that amateurisation and, and democracy comes with a, a lack of quality control. What some people would call a gatekeeper is also a quality controller. Um, and you look at the newsrooms around New Zealand now and see the demise of sub-editors, and you can see the impact that the internet is having there. Um, on the flip side, the nation can do things. We, the, the pressures it puts on an organisation, a small team like mine, we are tweeting. We have a Twitter panel now that Carrie's been on, um, which is a great way to involve people in, in discussion. Um, but we are also then cutting extra stuff. We're making stackable video, video for YouTube and for Facebook. Um, the workload is going up, and of course we don't have the resources to, uh, which are commensurate with that. The final point is the, um, is, is the end product and resources part of it. The internet has sucked a lot of money out of journalism. Uh, print media relied on uh, classifieds. They're gone. Um, TV media relied on advertising uh, to a mass market that is shrinking rapidly. Um, and the advertising revenue from, from online is not uh, matching that. And that's coming, that pressure on resources is coming at a time when media businesses are expected to do more and more. Um, Journalism gets a lot of criticism these days, and much of it is, is founded. Um, but there's also an amazing level of quality going on now that um, 
nostalgia forgets um, quite how bad some of the journalism of, of past days was. I, a favourite story is, I, some of you who are old enough will remember the famous Simon Walker, Rob Muldoon interview from the 1970s, uh, 1976, I think, um, in which Muldoon called the TV interviewer a smart aleck, and I'm not coming along here to be lectured to by a sm young smart aleck. Famous bit of New Zealand television. You actually watched that 10-minute interview. The first nine minutes was the most turgid bit of television, <laughs> going over the ins and outs of, of Russian um, uh, nations evil vessels, um, and it really only got lively in that last 30 seconds. So um, there is some amazing journalism going on, but there is pressure on the resources. You can compare that interview with an interview that Candace and Cooper did on CNN yesterday with Donald Trump, where in 15 minutes they were fact-checking live as the interview went through. So by the end of the interview, Cooper could come back and say, actually, Mr Trump, you just said that um, X about um, the number of migrants coming to America, in fact, that we fact-check it, and you're wrong. So there is a quality that you can do now that, that the internet gives. I guess the, the problem we're facing is that decision made in the 1990s where uh, media organisations went, yeah, the internet's free, let's just, let's just put everything out there for free, that's the, that's the model. Um, almost a generation on, we're struggling uh, to pay our way now and that is the fundamental but that, uh, that we are facing as, as journalists as we try to adapt or die. Excellent. All right. So before we uh, throw the floor open to, well, come to you guys on the floor for uh, some questions, we'll turn first to Queenstown. And there they are. Oh, my goodness, the technology might actually be working. We are talking to ANSCA, which is the Australian New Zealand Communications Association. I think you guys have been listening in. I can see a mute button on your end, so I'm hoping that means you can hear me. I think you guys have been listening in. I can see a mute button on your end, so I'm hoping that means I just said that, didn't I? If you've got any comments you'd like to make, uh, now's the time. Yes. Tech journalist uh, engenders a sphere of incompetence. There we go. If you've got any comments you'd like to make, uh, now's the time. Yeah. Questions, comments. Yeah, let me ask a question uh, for Alex Lee. Yes. Yeah, you. Tech journalist uh, engenders oh, a sphere of this. incompetence. There we go. It's just gone down. Yeah, a question uh, for Alex Lee. <laughs> yeah, you. Tech journalist. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned that uh, you are trying to develop new forms of uh, storytelling for documentaries. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. What kind of forms are you thinking of development? What do you think would be the, the clues, the keys for the, uh, the new forms of, uh, of uh, storytelling? And also, you said that... Uh, I'm sorry, it's a two-part question. <laughs> uh, you mentioned that uh, the, uh, the audience would be willing to interact. But that's, uh, I'm not quite sure about that. Because the, the history of the past uh, few centuries, I mean, a few decades, uh, like 20 or 30 years, show that there have been many attempts to make people interact with films uh, and with documentaries. And people, many people seem to be just wanting to sit down and relax and watch the film. So I wonder what's your, what your opinion on this? Thank you. With documentaries and people? Fantastic. I think we might just cut the sound on that because that was spectacular. But yeah, the question to Alex is um, uh, how, how real is this, this dream of interaction with the audience? Do people want to uh, interact? In, in respect of um, interaction, I think that in the area specifically of documentary, uh, and we are dealing with uh, matters that are of social importance, there is a real desire for people to interact. Um, if you look at a number, there are a number of websites, in particular I'll refer you to an organisation called the National Film Board of Canada. The National Film Board of Canada is one of the most innovative organisations in the world that has developed a whole lot of transmedia and interactive documentaries. They will tell a story and they'll get people to join up as part of the community to, to use um, perhaps a game scenario, um, perhaps a forum where people can actually answer questions, interact with each other, and the uptake of that is very strong. 
Um, you will find that when you go to any uh, broadcast commissioner, whether it's the BBC, TVNZ, um, ABC in Australia, that everyone asks you, the first of all, uh, the question is, how do you build your community? What is your transmedia or digital interactive um, strategy? Um, you just can't come in there with a single project, which is just something that goes up on film and television. You need to think about all the community building. So in that regard, I think it is very much alive. Absolutely. I think that's right. There's, there's a real um, need to interact um, in real time. And I watch my kids uh, watching television with, with an iPad and possibly a phone as well. And if something slows down, they move on to the next screen and go around in a big circle. But they're interacting. Yes. I have five devices with me when I sit down in my living room. I've got my laptop, I've got my phone, I've got my smart TV, I've got my, um, I've got my iPad, and I always have a secondary phone. <laughs> and I am using different things for the purposes of trying to find information. And I think that that is actually the way things have adapted for most people. That's, that's exactly right. Hands up who watched the royal wedding. Come on, you know you were there. I saw you all on Twitter. I am the last person to be a royalist, believe me. Uh, my wife loves a, a good pageant, so she was watching, and I was watching on Twitter. And there was a community of people engaging. We were having a lot of fun. We were trying to be the first to crack the princess bride jokes, marriage, uh, and so on. But we were there. We were a community, and we were engaging while it was, it was streaming live. And despite the content, it was really quite fascinating to watch, to see that coming together. Thank you for that. Have we got any questions here in the room? Microphone people. There's a man with his hand up. Remember my rules. Is the mixing of advertising and the content undermining the integrity of journalism? Sounds like one for Tim. The mixture of advertising and journalism. Um, it's not hitting, that's not hitting my world terribly much at the moment. I'm in a slightly privileged New Zealand in a bubble. Um, in print, I think it's probably happening the most. There's, um, what's the phrase they're using now? Um, uh, content ma marketing yeah, is the new the, one. The, there's, yeah. a, there's what used to be called advertorials. That's now, right, yeah. Yeah, that are, are now called, I they've got another cute name. Um, but yeah, and, and that's, that is pressure because of, of, of I guess, the, the broken model that I'm, I'm fundamentally talking about, is that um, more news organisations uh, having to break a lot of rules they would never have broken 20 years ago um, because if they don't get the money the newsrooms get even smaller um, and they're largely a third or half the size as they were when I started as a journalist anyway. So um, yeah, standards are being compromised and rules are being broken just to keep the business afloat. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's, that's a worry. It's not I think, something that anybody would um, rush to do um, but it's uh, increasingly a reality for a lot of commercial news organisations. Brenda? Um, I think it was Megan who mentioned the speed at which things are published and some of the sources is a person in Hawke's Bay with a smartphone that's already there. I go to mainstream media because I have this maybe pure faith that it's somewhat verified and I, I was going to ask, is that true? Um, yeah, absolutely. We have seen it time and time and time again, and the best example is the Boston bombings, where there was just information everywhere, mm. and Reddit chasing down people that they said were the, were the perpetrators and were completely wrong. And um, when I'm looking at stuff on Twitter for, for a, a breaking news event, I have people that I trust. Um, and yeah, I would never put, say, you know, Twitter reports that... Um, I don't know, um, the Prime Minister has resigned without calling the Prime Minister's office. That We just wouldn't do that. So, yeah, absolutely. That, is, that, in fact, is when I said we don't know what our job is anymore, that, in fact, is our job, is verifying those claims that are being made. I just want to pick up on something that Tim said, actually. He mentioned the going down to the basement and getting the manila folders. We still have manila folders. In fact, on my desk, I've got Michelle's, um, which, <laughs> yeah, from when I interviewed Michelle a couple of months ago, which has spectacular photos from 19, the 1980s and 90s and her amazing hair. Um, and, and when we're doing stuff that's not breaking news, but that is kind of more long form, more serious journalism, and especially if it involves interviewing people, those things are invaluable. I interviewed Dolly Parton um, a couple of years ago and her file in the library is about that thick and it's just all newspaper clippings 
and I couldn't have done the interview without it. Um, and for the programs like Nine to Noon and Afternoons and Nights, they Info Find, which is our library, that is invaluable. So, yeah, we are. We're always trying to verify that stuff. So are we going to see a world where we've got long-form journalism like that with those in-depth interviews and that research in one media and the pacey, snappy, there's a fire downtown, the cars are broken down, something's happened, the Prime Minister's resigned in social media as, instead? Is it, are, are we seeing that split or is that just wishful thinking? I, th I mean, I think we're doing both. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly on the radio, we're doing both. I mean, nine to noon, you have a five-minute news bulletin at the top of the hour, which gives you that hopefully latest news, and then you might have a 45-minute feature interview with someone. Um, I think, you know, we, Radio New Zealand, certainly needs to get better at what we're doing on social media and getting that news out on social media and interacting with that audience. Um, I think we don't know yet where it's going to end up. Which is great, which is really exciting. That's that's the fun part. Good time to be there, Wally. Uh, may I uh, present an anecdote, an example that happened recently? I was in Qatar at the Doha, at the uh, Al Jazeera forum, uh, media forum, and uh, one interesting th thing happened. We saw a series of images on Twitter posted by my sister, who happens to be the Minister of Information in Yemen. <laughs> <laughs> And then I said, oh, sis, what have you done? <laughs> These are fake. And, and apparently some people have actually shared them. And then we came up to see that, OK, there was already one wise uh, guy who said, OK, uh, did you check the authenticity? And it, apparently these images were posted many years ago and they weren't about the civil war that's happening in the country. And so uh, she obviously re re deleted and re apologized. But then. This has been a good awakening. If officials can't verify, I mean, how would regular citizens? And so the media's role is very crucial here, is that it needs to use technology in itself to verify the images. One example is using the reverse image search. Have you heard of it? Mm. I mean, basically, you put in the image so you can see if it has been published before. 10i and image reverser by Google are an example. So, and then there's also another important feature that has come up recently, which are verified accounts on social media. And I think this is a very critical tool, because if a person's account is verified, then you get to know that at least the content that this person pr publishes is by him or her. And uh, these two uh, indicators show that we are adapting. Technology is beginning to realize how to fix its own mistakes. Thank you. Where's the microphone? There we are. Uh, kia ora. Um, I wondered if the panel had an opinion on tools such as Data Miner, which are automatically surfacing news as it happens across multiple social networks, and whether you thought that had implications for what journalism is likely to look like in the next few years. Who wants to go with that? I've just installed one of those. I'll just find it. Banjo, um, to, which is uh, monitoring my feed and taking news as I retweet it. And then if enough of us in the room start tweeting about this kind of thing, it will percolate up and they'll, uh, they'll flag something somewhere in some bunker filled with screens and something will happen. But it's, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting take, isn't it, using, using the social media elements as um, providers of, of content. Maybe. Where should we start? Walid? Again, we come to the question of technology uh, is, it cannot solve the issues in itself, humans behind the technology. So this software will have to have develop some sort of algorithm. I'm, I'm not familiar with the exact details, but uh, to think of it logically, uh, if the sources that are used are also not reliable, then the so solution won't be. So it ultimately ends up in, in a cycle of uh, repeating the same mistakes. There needs to be a way to break the cycle and through which we need to have a verification mechanism that's embedded in the technology itself that is reliable enough. And then there will always be a, some sort of metric measurement of how reliable, because you can't absolutely say true or false. And there will always be some margin of error, but the lower that margin, the better. I'll look simply to say I agree with, I agree with that. There's, there's, there's going to be no um, replacement for human judgment, mm. um, and that's what journalists are still valuable for. Um, again, I know there's a... We uh, have spending a lot of time on Twitter and, and seeing the, the, the criticism we get for our flaws. Um, at the end of the day, you need someone who 
um, has some experience and some expertise. It's when you've been to, when you've spent years in a courtroom covering court cases, or you've been doing politics for a decade, or whatever, then that kind of expertise um, is, I still think, more valuable than a than an algorithm or a um, ability to, you know, um, push something to the top of a list somewhere mm. on a computer screen. And yet we're seeing newsrooms hollowed out, aren't we? we? You might end up with one editor and a raft of juniors, and there is none of that institutional memory. I remember when I started uh, as a reporter, you would have, gosh, there would have been five or six senior journalists with a lot of experience who could say, now steady on, it's just a press release, let's just breathe quietly and, you know, let's let's remember what they said five years ago. Well, all of that's disappeared, hasn't it? Yeah, there's, there's, there's fewer, there are fewer and fewer. I mean, I was a feature writer at the Herald, God, I don't know, 10 or something years ago, and there were eight of us, maybe. Mm. There's one and a half, two That's now. That's right. Um, of, and, you know, the relatively senior positions, the, the newsroom is much smaller. Um, and there are still, the, the, you know, the heroes of the business are the Simon Collins and Matty Dernleys and these kind of guys who are still doing the business um, on the floor. But either people have gone into PR or gone into management or moved out of the business altogether um, because it's just getting too hard. It's just too hard. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's right. Um, but you're right, that kind of, that kind of experience um, is what helps the, the, the juniors learn something. Mm. And, you know, I taught um, for a semester at AUT in, in New Media, and I was, you know, not particularly encouraged by the, um, the students have to go out and source stories, and most of them were press release, were just, they'd found them online as press releases and yeah. tried to say, this is my story. That's, that's right. And I was just going, nah. Very quickly, onto that, the human element. I mean, uh, one advantage of having to fly 30 hours to New Zealand is that you watch lots of movies. Oh and and uh, <laughs> I, I did watch a couple of movies about artificial intelligence. I believe it's Ex Machina and uh, Chappie. Yep. I'm not sure if you've seen those. But the bottom line is that uh, the intention of having uh, the humans would always try to uh, find a way to replace humans' involvement in the whole process so that machines themselves would think for themselves. And apparently, the, both have a, had a bad ending. So you can tell, <laughs> you can tell it, doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, so yes, uh, human elements is, is essential as far as I know. Where are we with the microphones? Can't see if we're looking. There we are, sir. Um, so, Tim, I think you mentioned uh, earlier something rather interesting. Uh, we, I think we can all agree that the internet has profoundly changed the media landscape, but um, you also mentioned something about the, uh, you alluded to the rose-tinted glasses of hindsight, you know, and the nostalgia for, for the way things used to be. Do you think that, to a certain extent, the, the fact that anyone can fact-check now, instead of being largely uh, limited to, to people with the resources of old-style journalism, um, that we now have the possibility of actually um, we, we, may, we may be able to see all the warts in journalism more readily now than, than we could in the past because no one was there available to actually check the facts. Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can see all our warts. It's most annoying. Um, no, look, let me give you a journalist's answer. On one hand, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, we're held to account, which is obviously great. Um, and the ability for people to be a little bit journalistic at home and so forth is, is great. Um, on the other hand... My point still is that nothing replaces someone who does that full time day in day out and builds up a, 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 an institutional knowledge around that. You're also, I think, as as we're talking about here, is you're reliant on where you're fact checking. I was just talking to a friend at the weekend who was talking about a relation back in America who is delaying their trip to um, to, to come to New Zealand because they think. Obama's probably going to declare martial law because of all the jihadis flooding into America at the moment any time now, so they might just wait a bit to buy their ticket. Um, so t if you're fact-checking off Fox, then there's only so much you're going um, to you're get, you know? There aren't so many you can find. <laughs> so, so again, it's going to come down to the access to a diversity of knowledge and the human expertise. Fantastic. Where are we now? Have we got any non-media questions, uh, non-journalism questions, I should say? We'll bring these two in as well. I'll go on then just ask anyway. I would like to follow up on Brenda Wallace's um, point about verification. Um, we are facing, with the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership and some other agreements that are being negotiated around the world, some content which is really going to seriously transform our society and what might be reproduced, um, actually, in which, whichever media 
difficult to verify, and we often just get quotes from politicians without actually deeper digging. Um, what can we actually do? What can be done when a situation is difficult to verify with this new media um, to help improve on that situation and, and help us with, in a situation where we're going to have a very short period of time for consultation? Right, so that's exactly, that's the WikiLeaks model, isn't it, where um, somebody decides, I'll just tell everybody everything right away and uh, dump the whole lot out there. Everybody on the panel is looking, not making eye contact. <laughs> Nobody wants to handle that one. <laughs> I'll blather on then. It's, uh, it is. It's quite critical. I think these are great tools and great democratising tools and a great way of um, uh, communicating with people around this problem of censorship, whether it's for economic reasons or for political. Uh, it's very hard to shut down the debate when you've got access to tools like Twitter and uh, WikiLeaks and everything else that goes on. By the time something, that, you know, the by the time something's published once, it's published everywhere, and that means we've got a lot more opportunity to uh, hopefully find out what's going on and, and have our say. I'll, I'll give you the but to that one, though, yeah. which is that um, a, a lot of people in power then say, well, I've, I'm, I'm really engaged, I'm really accountable, I'm really open, because mm. he, you know, here's my Twitter feed, and here are my press releases, and here's all my, so, my social media engagement. doesn't mean they're actually willing to, to, to be asked questions. That's right. Um, so uh, people can actually hide behind um, the quantity of media yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, without actually being forced to d confront quality I think media. Dick Cheney calls it the, um, the, the blizzard. He would send out a blizzard of memos, and you'd just be buried in paperwork. You wouldn't be able to see. But at least you've got something to work with then, and then you crowdsource that. So we get Keith Eng to, uh, to whip up a quick infographic and we're all good. The other thing is too that they have as, uh, as many staff doing communications as we have journalists. Like MSP uh, um, has, yes. yeah. And so you know, it's not just that we're up against the minister; we're up against their staff as well. And mm. and and doing things like not writing things down so we can't make OIA requests about what happened and stuff like that. So it's not just that you know we you know dumping information everywhere is fantastic, and if we can get that information, that's great, and totally do stories about it. I did stuff on afternoons this week about. Um, hacking team, I mean, mostly made jokes about security of passwords, but you know, like, <laughs> like having that information was really useful. And I've done stories about the TPP, not in any way um, in, at a high level, but just like, here's this thing that you probably need to know about, and let me explain a little bit about it, um, which I would hope is a really good thing to do because most people don't know what it is and why it's important. No, that's right. And that's the role of journalism, isn't it? The fifth estate. You've got to actually tell people you should care about this. And, 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 and again, the diversity actually creates problems. The, the number of times I hear people say, you know, geez, the, the mainstream media just isn't, you know, isn't taking the TPP, for example, seriously. Where are the stories? And I'm going, oh, my God, where are the stories? Search. I mean, I've done them. Mm. Megan's done them. We, but because there are so many and it's so splintered and fragmented... You know, again, in 1970, you would go home, everybody would watch TV 101. That's right. And you would know whether a TPP story was done or not. Now, so many stories are just missed in the blizzard of, of um, content that's Cam being shared around. Yeah, I'm training my kids to be journalists, in effect, because they get bombarded with so many marketing um, uh, messages constantly. Uh, and whenever they come up with one of these factoids they've learned from what is, to me, pure marketing, that they are treating as fact. I say, now, what is it? And they say, it's marketing. <laughs> and so they're learning slowly. But I think we've got to train our kids to be journalists, in effect, haven't we? Yeah. We've got to train them to be sceptical. Yes. Citation needed. Show me the proof. That's, that's exactly right. Someone with a microphone. Th this, I hope, can, can apply to, to all of the panellists. I'm interested in the economic side of this. You know, if you look across New Zealand, uh, most of our content is still very much ad-supported um, to, to increasingly... Um, you know, for, for increasingly poor outcomes, but around the world other models are, are evolving. Where do you guys see the, the economic support for high quality content coming from in the future? Um, if anybody knows a sugar daddy, yeah. <laughs> I'm in. Um, no, it's quite seriously, I look back to the Washington Post model of, of 100 years ago and, you know, and, th and think, a really, you know, a noble family willing to actually invest in the public for a uh, public um, space is is a pretty wonderful model these days. Um, well, that's what Amazon's doing, isn't it? They bought yeah. the Washington Post. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's Jeff new Bezos media saying, that "Hey, that's cool. We'll have one of those." Um, I mean, we've got. I rely on New Zealand on air. I get to make an hour of television, which is, um, you know, 
pretty highbrow by New Zealand standards at the moment um, because I get a million dollars of, of your taxpayers' money, thanks, um, every year. Um, these guys get all of their money. Um, ad revenues are just, are just a really hard place at the moment, and so I think some kind of paywall thing has to. I mean, I just don't see how else. NBR seems to be doing all right, doesn't it, with its paywall? Um, yeah. And that is a, it's a specialised um, uh, media. It's it, you know it's focused purely on business, but it's but it's, paid it's gathering for mostly by business accounts. Exactly, so that's, that's right. It's not personal it. accounts. I mean, the Herald's been about to introduce a paywall for how many years now? Oh, and look, they keep stopping yeah. because they just think it's going to bugger them. So. Oh, time's up. No, keep going. Lights are off. Yeah. Who's got a microphone? There we are. Chris. Ah, this, this, this ties into where the conversation was going before. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, voice in the sky. Yeah. Carry on, sir. Um, does the media have a responsibility to keep important things like the TPPA in sort of the public focus and the public attention? I, I know it's a difficult thing, but is there something more that could be done there? You've been given Radio the birds. New Zealand birds. I'm going to complain to them. No, um, um, yes, we do. I mean, the the public service of what we do, the very core of journalistic ethics, is that the important things should be at the top. But sort of reiterating Tim's point, so much is happening all of the time. Like, when was the last time we heard about um, I don't know the Malaysian Airlines flight? When was the last time anyone heard about that? When was the last time anyone heard about girls kidnapped? Um, you know, all of those things. It's really hard to do. I had a, a podcast that I, one of the things we wanted to do was spend five minutes uh, every at the end of every week and go, all right, when, when was the last time we heard about this story that was a hmm. big deal six months ago? But it's constantly happening. There is actually a thing someone was telling me about yesterday called... Delayed Gratification Magazine, I think it is. Um, they call it Slow Journalism, and what they do is uh, six months after a news event, they go back to a place where something happened and do a story about it. Um, and it's sort of the, it's exactly that, and it's the complete opposite of what we do, and I'm totally planning to steal it. Um, because, yeah, like, yeah, we should be bringing those stories up um, and bringing them back, and if there is new things, then finding out new things. We have a system in the newsroom where... Uh, manila folders, again, um, or brown envelopes, I think they might be, um, of stories that have been ongoing for a really long time, and some of them are years and years old. And every once in a while, there'll there be in a diary, there'll be a check to, to check that story, and that's someone's job that day to check it and ring and say, is anything new? And the vast majority of the time, nothing is new, and so there's not really a place to put it. But, yeah, we do try. Um, maybe I should... Uh, suggest a particular uh, avenue for income. Uh, I understand it's all about money when it comes to the situation of journalism right now. One area that I've seen still not fully tapped is data journalism. And in fact, this is the moment where uh, me, uh, the, the information, the data, is already possible to extract online. And so the only need by journalists is to connect the dots. I mean, there are various reports coming out by media, uh, by banks, by governments, uh, and there are many discrepancies. There are many issues that need to be questioned and asked. But journalists still do not have the knowledge, or let's say the training, to be able to extract data and do the analysis and figure out the basic fundamental flaws in a particular system. That would become a big story later on. So if they invest more time in understanding data journalism and how to implement that, then I think that's one very, uh, let's say, beneficial way to move forward. Mm, that's right. My question's not about media. Um, Carrie, um, I have a te reo question. I'm not fluent in te reo at all, but are you not? Oh, I can't ask my question. Maybe you know. Um, I, I was wondering if you know how far um, through a digital day a person could go and only experience te reo in this country, and what sort of digital things you're like, English or nothing? Is this? I actually, I actually think um, people can go out the whole day. There are people, like in your social networks, uh, you can choose, obviously, who you're going to interact with. And I know there's a number of people online who are fluent speakers and who only tweet, for instance, in te reo, um, who work in organisations where that's the key language or where that's their job. Um, so I think 
the good thing about social media is that it's also kind of protecting dialects, so individuals are in control of their reo as well, um, which it, and it is opening it up to other people. So I've noticed, particularly over the last couple of years, um, more non-Māori are using the, the odd word in their conversations, and they're trying to include it. I mean, this event, Net Hui, you know, like it, we're, we're making it, I guess, more accessible um, through, through using social media um, kind of sites. So I think that... Um, it's a, it, it's a survival, like it's a way that we can ensure the survival of, of te reo and actually give access to everyone. Um, so hopefully that answers. Fantastic. Right, here in the middle. Hello. Uh, is on its way. It is. Is this on? It's good. Hi. Uh, I'm a big Noam Chomsky fan myself from way back, and we've talked a lot about the financial pressures that are on. I read recently somewhere that the number of media companies that own uh, uh, that are owned has shrunk. Uh, it's being basically reduced to a handful of companies worldwide that own the major news providers. Given that reality and the financial pressures that exist, uh, how do you see media striking a balance between the status quo, supporting the status quo, and challenging the status quo? Hmm. God, you're going to get bored of me. I'm sorry. Um, <sighs> It depends what it depends which status quo you're talking about to some extent. Um, there, is all, there has always been that tension within any, in any journalism. Um, it's probably growing with the shrinking of um, the number of media companies. Um, but I think because it's always been there, journalists have always been profoundly aware of it. And, I, and the reality is that the vast majority of journalists I know are still in the business to challenge authority. That's kind of why they're there, why they're usually difficult pricks. Um, <laughs> and, and why, you know, it's, it's, it's so it's, it's I, 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 you know, if you're just putting out press releases, um, then <coughs> you might as well just go home. So yeah, look, it's, it's a constant tension. It's probably getting a bit harder, um, but I don't think it's actually astronomically harder than it was. I don't know if... And that's right, I get very upset when I see newsrooms getting rid of prickly journalists because, frankly, that's, that's what they're after. Yeah. <laughs> you want them to ask questions and say, I don't believe you. It's the difficult Lisa answer. Owen asking for an OIA request on her own bosses. That's legendary. <laughs> that is absolutely brilliant. She, but we are. Yeah, you know, um, Brooke Saban, a little OIA robot. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, and Lisa's still tossing those things out and that's right. still wants to do, diff the, you know, Lisa's always pushing me to do the most difficult stories we can do. So yeah. th those people still exist and are there, believe me. All um, power to Making it. my life as difficult as possible. <laughs> Tim's going to need a drink shortly as well. <laughs> but we are out of time, so I want you to join me in thanking our panellists today.